this episode. I take a sip from a nuclear waste canister. There's treasure in the toilet in the randomizer. And we bid a fond farewell to two Jerry Anderson legends. That's all coming up in Pod 86 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Richard James. It's the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Hello, Jamie Anderson. How are you doing? There you go. Good. Especially now we've so efficiently introduced the whole thing. Yes. Now, let's just say up front, yep. there are, once again, some sombre notes to yes. this edition. Yes. We will come to those things later, but let's try and keep things, yeah. you know, relatively positive because that, you know, there's a lot of sadness Yeah. kind of behind many Jerry Anderson things because of how they are and how all the contributors are, and yeah. we will pay our respects to Nicholas Parsons and Antillo later on. Of course, of course. But we will still have all the usual stuff that comes with the Jerry Anson podcast. What are those things that come with the podcast, Richard? Well, the things that come with the podcast are the notorious randomizer from Chris Dale. We've got some news from the Jerry Anderson universe, of course, and we've got fab facts. And I've got some uh, posts from uh, various Facebook groups and pages and Twitter and all that sort of stuff as well. I think that's about it, isn't it? I think it probably is, yes. Yeah. And um, we are going to give our listeners one more week to leave reviews oh. before we do another prize draw. I see. Good so idea. So you can be in with a, a chance there. So we'll yes. explain more about that later on. Yes, great. And you may have noticed, listeners, on the title of this podcast that this week's special feature is in honour of the late great Nicholas Parsons. We're going to have the first 15 minutes from the Terror Hawks audio story, The Sale of the Galaxy. Brilliant. You know, where Richard... Uh, Richard, Richard, you did take part in that recording, and we'll yes. talk about that later no, on I did. too. That's true. But in fact, where Nicholas played Zelda's ex-husband, yeah, uh, art imitated life. Yeah, it's more about that in the Jerry Anderson news. Yes, good. Do you want a fab fact to try and get I mean, things rolling? Ugh, must we? I think we must. Oh, and go on. Then. Here is that fab fact. <laughs> now, time for this week's fab facts. Fab facts, Richard. Yeah. Now, you normally tell me off for overcomplicating the explanation. Yeah, so keep it simple, Jamie. What is Fab Facts all about? We've got a book of Fab Facts. Yep. I flick through it, Richard shouts, Fab, we stop, and I read the Fab Facts. There you go. You see? Didn't take long at all, did it? Doesn't sound as exciting, though, does it? I mean, when I want to talk about Fab Facts, Mm. I'm thinking really of something like the Thunderbird 2 launch sequence. Oh, are you now? Whereas... Rather than just getting the book yeah. and flicking through and that kind of thing, I've nice. got whole all manner of ramps and slides yeah. and rotating gizmos and folding chairs, etc. Yeah. yeah, okay. That actually bring fab right. facts to life. All right, no, no, Jamie. Yet again, you're spending longer introducing fab facts than we actually take doing the item fab facts. I literally cannot help myself. Oh. Okay, I'm stopping now. Here is the book, Richard. Are you ready with your fab? I'm born ready with my fab. Fab. I thought you left it quite late there, but we're actually... Well, we're in both the late 60s and the 80s here. Oh, straddling decades. Yes, with quite an interesting story. Although, unfortunately, it does relate to Joe 90. Okay, go on then. So, (laughs) the fab fact is as follows. Professor McLean's late wife, Hmm. who would therefore have been Joe 90's adoptive mother... Yes. Mary McLean... Well, now you know her name. But she never appeared in the Joe 90 television series. Oh. For a very specific reason. Right. That being? That reason being that she was deceased. Ah, okay. We never really talked about, but like, many fans have wondered over the years what she might have looked like in puppet form. Mm-hmm. But in the 1980s, a photographic negative turned up in the ITC film library marked as Joe 90's mother. Uh, really? Yeah. And the image was indeed of a female supermarination puppet. Yeah. But rather than being a sculpture of a brand new character, it was actually a reused old one. Okay. There's nothing wrong with a reused old one, no, of course. No. In this case, it appears to be a dark haired Symphony Angel. Oh. Symphony did turn up a few times in Joe 90 as well with dark hair, but always in minor roles. Yes. 
I see. So nobody knows why this photo was taken. Mm. It might have been intended for merchandising, like probably the TV21 comic, possibly. So it's story right. about Joe's adopted mother or, you know, Professor McLean's wife, whatever. Or maybe they really were going to have that character. Or maybe it was just for a photo on Matt's yeah. desk. Yeah, okay. Who knows? There could have been all manner of reasons. Yeah. Right. I think, actually, the, the photo on Mac's desk ended up being a real human woman. Weird. Holding a dog. Strange. So foreshadowing there of the Secret Service. <laughs> yeah. So we don't know why it exists. Right. We'll never know because the reasons behind it are lost. Yeah. And, you know, again, with the lost people like Alan Patillo, those stories are going to disappear now. Yeah. Yeah. But it would be quite interesting. And perhaps, perhaps there was going to be a soap opera style, I faked my own death return. <laughs> what, but Joe 90 steps out of the shower? Yeah, it's exactly. A, it's all a dream. <laughs> Like in the first exactly episode. that, yes. <laughs> now, we do have, thanks very much to Chris Dale of Randomizer fame, mm. we have that picture, which obviously, because this is a podcast, we can't describe to you. Yeah. But later this week, after the day of release, on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, there will be this fab fact, which you're listening to right now, and you'll be able to see the image oh, of Joe Ninety's adoptive mother. I mean, would they have gone to all the effort of making... I know it was an old puppet, but would they have gone to that effort if it wasn't going to feature somehow... And then it just never did? Well, unless it was a bit of fun. Mm. You know, I, I mean, it could even be the case that somebody's got the picture and gone, oh, I know, I'll, I'll give everybody a bit of a tease and I'll right. write Joe 90's mum on it and yes. see what happens. Yeah. And then forgot about it. And then, you know, 10 years later it was discovered. Hmm. Who knows? So there's never any prospect of doing a, a prequel or a flashback scene or anything like that, do you think? Wait, we don't know. There could yeah. have been a flashback, maybe. Of course there could. Who oh, knows? Oh. But that's one of the many exciting things about uh, Archive TV... Yes. Is that quite often mysteries come up to which we'll never actually no. know the real answer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And this is one of those. Yeah. No, I like it. Very good. There you go. So despite being Joe Knight, it's quite a cool fact. Quite a cool fact. But yeah, we shouldn't uh, dilly-dally any longer. Let's bring it to an end. Let's that's not the dwell. end of this week's... Joe fact. fact! Ah, now Joe Knight he does seem to creep into this podcast a bit, doesn't he? He's wily like that. Gets in under he the is. radar. Yeah, but it's also, you see, because I know that I don't like Joe 90, but many, many people do. There are literally several of them. Yeah. <laughs> and so I want to make sure we cater for those people as well. Oh, fair enough. Now, people have been emailing in to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Of course they have. They do it every week. For example, Ashley Bell got in touch to say, hi, Jamie and Richard, how are you? Hope you both had a good Christmas and New Year. Crikey, it's a while ago now. And at last he says everything is back to normal. (laughs) Speak for yourself. Anyway, he says, I was channel hopping, as you do, to find something to watch, and I came across two TV programmes. The first was Celebrity Mastermind, to see who was going to sit in that famous black leather chair. And who do I find on Mastermind but TV newscaster and Space 1999 fan Samira Ahmed, dressed in cosplay as one of the Moonbase Alphans. Not only that... Fast forward now, he says to New Year's Day, I sat down to watch Dracula, as many of us did, and while watching it, I saw Dracula having dinner with his mother and recognised the actress, Catherine Schell. And I suddenly say to myself, it's Maya from Space 1999. It was. There. Two Space 1999 related TV shows on over Christmas. (laughs) <laughs> the Dracula is more of a stretch, though, yeah, isn't it? it is it, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Yes, clearly the effect of Space 1999 is still being felt today in modern television. Yes, now I didn't see that mastermind. How did Samira do? Oh, come on, Richard. You know she won, Yay. didn't she? She only went and won it. That's what she did. Clever Samira. And now, secondly, Nathan Healy got in touch to say, Good morning. Very formal. Good morning. I have two questions, please, if I may just ask, says Nathan. The first is, do you have some idea when the Blu-ray set version of Stingray might be released? And the second is, if and when a Blu-ray set of my other favourite, The Secret Service, hopefully will be released. Many thanks and fabulous work with the podcast. Great listening from Nathan. So, Stingray? Nope. No news? Uh, Secret Service? Nope. So what I can say is that I know that that Stingray is next on the list for the network doing the restoration, and I believe it may have already started. Yeah. But that is all I can say. I think in order of kind of importance of shows, the Secret Service is fairly low down the list, although I know we've obviously done Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Joe 90. Yeah, yeah. But I think it'll be a while yet for that. But yeah. Stingray, I hope, will be maybe available possibly even later this year or early early cool. 2021. As soon as we know, we will let you know. Of the course. 
Exactly. So yeah, do keep uh, the emails coming in, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, and we'll try and read some out next time. That's a promise. Isn't it? Probably, yes. Yeah. Uh, right. I did so say we, we'll try. We always try. Can't say whether we succeed that often or not. <laughs> anyway, should we go on to the Jerry Anderson news, Richard? Let's have some news, Jamie. Okay. Right, so the Jerry Anson news this week is obviously headed up by a couple of sad stories. Yes. Which I'm sure you've already all heard, but uh, if not, that's the passing of the late Nicholas Parsons mm-hmm. and Alan Patillo. Yep. Now, in honour of Nicholas, we have 15 minutes of Sail of the Galaxy, which is our Terrorhawk story featuring him as Nickel Plate Starsons. Yes. So that's coming up instead of our interview this week which hopefully you'll enjoy, but it's certainly Nicholas having a lot of fun and messing around. Now, Richard, you were at that particular recording, weren't you? Why were you there loitering awkwardly? Because you asked me, Jamie. Oh, that's why. Yeah, Yeah. no, I think Nicholas could only make it on a certain day and the rest of the cast couldn't. So that was it, yes. It was Nicholas, Denise, you and me on a Saturday yes, morning. That's right. You drafted me in to play just about every other character. Yes. Only to be revoiced, of course. Such is my career. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I got into a sound booth next door to Nicholas Parsons. It was fantastic. What an experience. A real pro. A really lovely and very self-effacing chap, actually. Very professional, of course. Wanted to give of his best, even... For this silly little thing that was, you know... I beg your pardon. <laughs> well, in terms of his huge, expansive career, yes. a, a drop in the ocean, but still applied himself 100%, didn't he? It was fantastic. Yeah, and it was the first time that he and Denise had worked together yeah. on an Anderson thing, yeah. as well, since Four Feather Falls, really, yeah. where they did do a commercial or two for Blue Cars Travel. Right. Mm. 1960 I think yes yes and obviously Denise and Nicholas had been married and in this yeah, story yeah. Nicholas plays Nicholas Blake Starson's Zelda's ex-husband yeah so it was art imitating life and they they did it so nicely didn't they well, there they was did. A, lo- a lovely chemistry absolutely which worked rather well yeah so yes Nicholas had a long association with Anderson stuff because of that continued association via Terrorhawk starting with Four Feather Falls where he really only went to read in to be Tex Tucker right and then um I think Dad, I'm sure it was in Dad, said, I think we found our Tex Tucker. Yeah. And then he ended up playing Tex. Yeah. And then they went on to work on these uh, Blue Cars travel film and adverts. And the advert in particular, I was going to put into the podcast, but it's two Martians Hmm. speaking in, well, Martian to one another. And so it makes no sense without the picture. (laughs) But I always remember Nicholas saying to me that when they were shooting that advert, it was him and Denise Hmm. dressed in silly outfits looking through a telescope. And they were trying to get some sense of saying, oh, maybe we should, uh, you know, go to Earth. We'll have to find a decent travel agency okay. but without any English words. Ah. And they were really struggling. And Dad, I don't know what he said to them, but he gave some bit of direction to Nicholas. Yeah. That suddenly freed him up and they were suddenly able to do it. having ah. been struggling with this nonsense language for hours. Yeah. I had very fond memories of that. If you want to see that advert, this yes. is on the Lost Worlds of Jerry Anderson DVD set. Uh, great, great. So there you go, something there. But uh, yeah, more from Nicholas in a bit. And uh, obviously we send our sympathies and kind thoughts to his family and friends. Mm. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, very sad. So the other sad bit. Yeah. It happens, doesn't it? It does, yeah. In fact, we heard just this morning that, uh, this morning on the day of recording, that is, that Alan Patillo... Um, director, writer, script editor on yeah. most of the Supermarination shows. I think he wrote on UFO mm-hmm. and even directed a couple of episodes of Terrorhawks. Right. He actually passed away on the 16th of January, mm-hmm. but we only heard the news this morning. So very, very sad. Now, I've got a very, very short clip of Alan. Fascinating guy. Yeah. Great, great Southern Scottish accent. Oh, yes. Sort of, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, Edinburgh Morningside Cross, something yeah, like that. Really. He was in all sorts of documentaries. Unfortunately, we haven't got any archive material with him, so there's nothing that we can do to do yeah. a kind of special episode. But yeah. you can just tell in this tiny clip just how enthusiastic he was about his association with Thunderbirds. The Thunderbirds, we really went out of our way to make it more visually interesting. The sets were beautiful. The uh, characters were beautifully sculpted. Great attention was paid to the finish of them, the, the smoothness of the faces, the wigs they wore, the mouth mechanisms that they... We spoke through. They're like superstars, like, you know, like George Clooney is and Kim Basinger. Oh, lovely. Lovely chap. Yeah. Very eloquent and yeah. so enthusiastic about the shows. Yes. And, you know, you could hear, I think, a sense of pride 
in his voice and the way he talks about Thunderbirds. And he is credited with kind of bringing us a very special directorial style to the Supermarination show, starting on Four for the Fools. Right. That kind of was an essential part of the the whole, really. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's quite sweet, because so. in a way we're celebrating two sides of the same coin, aren't we, this week? Uh, you know, Nicholas Parsons being the performer, and then Alan being the other side of the camera. I mean, I often Well, they think, work together. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I often think that, you know, as actors, we're sort of... It. Well, we're dispensable, really. You can always get another actor. But actually, someone like Alan, who, you know, without people like him, the shows just wouldn't have existed full stop in the way that we know them now. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. And he, well, he directed Attack of the Alligators. Ah, yes. One of the best known ones. And the opening story as well, Trapped right. in the Sky. Right, okay. So, you know, the, probably the two of the most iconic episodes of Thunderbirds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go. And now, Alan had lived with Parkinson's for some time, so if you would like to make a uh, donation in his memory, you can do so to Parkinson's UK. Just mm-hmm. search on Google Parkinson's UK. And, um, yeah, I'll, again, our thoughts with his family and friends. Yeah, yeah, there we are. Now, it can't all be sad, no, but it still can be reflective. Yeah. And one of those things that makes the Jerry Anderson YouTube quite reflective are Chris Dale's primers. Ah, uh, yes, that's See true. What I mean, it's a bit of looking back on yeah. stuff. So, the weekend just gone, we've had our Thunderbirds Are Go primer, mm-hmm. the original uh, 1966 movie. And of course, the week before, we had uh, the Day After Tomorrow primer from Chris. Yeah, yeah. Which several people noted contains Brian Blessed not shouting. Good grief. Is- very unusual for anything with Brian Blessed. In. Yes. <laughs> so do pop along and watch those. Now, The Day After Tomorrow was made between Series 1 and Series 2 of Space 1999, and you probably heard me say in the opening that um, I've been taking a sip from a nuclear waste mug. Yeah, here he goes. Yeah, very good, Jamie. Mm. Mm-hmm. So uh, nuclear waste canisters, as seen in Space 1999, yeah. have courtesy of Chris Thompson being transformed into mugs oh now it makes sense because you yeah. see what you've got written on the script there yeah yeah nuclear waste yeah. canister oh bug, bug. yeah oh, yeah a typo there and i was thinking what <laughs> what on earth is he talking about a oh mug. dear no a mug I a see. mug great so does it yes. glow in the dark no it doesn't no. they're very well sealed Good. nuclear waste containers you see I so. see but, uh, yeah, excellent for storing hot uh, liquids in. Right. You know, like uh, tea and coffee. Okay. But not nuclear waste. No, wouldn't recommend it. Do not try this at home. There you go. So you can grab those in the Jerry Anderson store. Yeah. And there's a host of new designs and bits of pieces that Chris Thompson has been working on, including Fireball XL5. Mm-hmm. And even some doppelganger designs. Well, well. Do you get two for the price of one? Oh, hey. no. I was actually considering doing a mirrored version, but, yes. it's, you know, it's a big faff. Yes, so, and too you know. niche, really. Yeah, yeah, just let's have the earth, earthbound one rather than the mirror earth ones. Fair enough. So there you go. Yeah. That's all I have, Richard, mm. unless you have anything to add. Well, now, I oh, think, do. Jamie, well, I think we should talk about Fab Live because we, I have had a couple of uh, messages via Facebook and on Twitter as well. When is the next Fab Live? Because it's generally towards the beginning of each month. But Fab Live is going to be taking a little bit of an extended rest. Is that not so, Jamie? It is, yes. We are both quite busy. Mm. And, yeah, we'd like to bring Fab Live back with a renewed energy later in the year, yes. I think. So, for now, we're going to give it a little rest, let yep. it go off on a holiday, and yes. get some sun That's and right. uh, some R&R. Yeah. And it'll be back probably what uh, what I would refer to as Q3. Okay, sure, right. You think? Yeah, it's Sometime fun. sort of um, July, August, September, yeah. maybe. Great. That's when we'll probably be back with it. But there's lots of stuff going on in the meantime that just... Uh, is taking us away a little bit from yeah from yeah, normal routine. Well, it does take a whole day out of our diaries, doesn't it? That's the thing with travelling and preparation and so on. Yeah. And uh, I think things uh, you know might be uh, hotting up a little bit this year and you might need every hour that you can grab. No, nothing like that. Oh, really? Fine. Oh, I've, just oh, got, yeah, I've just got, you know, sheep to feed. Just got stuff. bored. Fair enough. No, 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 no. There is lots going on. Yeah. So, yes, thank you. Fab Live hiatus until Q3. Yeah. So Now... I do have another piece of news. Uh, more? Yes. Well, this is especially for our Facebook group members. Right. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons. The Podstron fanzine launch. Do you know about this, JB? I had caught wind of it, yes. but I haven't yet had time to read it. Yeah, so do pop on over to our Facebook group. And if you want to join, there are three questions to answer. And Abby has been collating the very first edition of... The uh, Podstron fanzine with uh, contributions from other Podstrons. So do take a look and let us know what you think. 
Perfect. All right. Isn't that amazing that everybody's put that effort in? Very to do that. So lovely, yeah. thank you, Postrons. Yeah. But that, I think now, unless you've got anything else you want to throw in, um, uh, oh. it's the end of the Jerry Anson oh. news. That was the news. That was the news. Nice. Yeah, I, I know if I leave you to do it, you'll just keep filling the air with nonsense. Of course. So. That's what I'm here for, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm your protege in that respect. Uh, yes, indeed. Over on our Facebook group, people, of course, have been uh, paying their respects to uh, Nicholas Parsons and uh, Alan Patillo as well. Bill Ronald, for example, says, So sad to hear of the death of Nicholas Parsons, who brought life to two-gun Tex Tucker, sheriff of Four Feather Falls. Happy trails, amigo. Morty Vicker posted, The entertainment world that Nicholas Parsons grew up with and in, which he rose to such prominence, was a demanding one. And so immense talent was required, and that is testament to him. It looked like such fun, though, and I hope he enjoyed it as much as he always seemed to. What a fantastic life and wealth of memories he leaves us and may his memory always be a blessing and Matthew Alderman Harris simply posted rest in peace Mr Parsons you will always be the one and only Tex Tucker that's rather lovely isn't it so I'll read out some messages about uh, Alan Patillo a little later on as well but it's lovely to see yet again when these people pass that they're leaving behind such fantastic memories and a wonderful legacy that we can all still enjoy yes that is the nice thing with the internet and uh, all these bits and pieces whether they be Uh, restorations of old shows and re-releases or found bits of archive that get out there or indeed newly recorded audio stories featuring those artists yes we had the opportunity to do that several times with the terror hawks audio series from big finish we brought back david graham yeah to play a couple of characters in series three Mm -hmm. but series two guest star was the marvelous nicholas parsons yes now bearing in mind his history with denise Breyer, who plays zelda i was slightly unsure as to whether he would go ahead with playing Nickel Plate Starsons, yeah. Zelda's uh, maniacal ex-husband. Mm-hmm. But to my amazement, he instantly emailed me back and said, yes, I'd love to. Yeah. Lovely. Fantastic. When can we do it? Yeah. And he really, really turned in a pretty stellar performance, I think. I agree. For yes. something which was outside of his comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. That's right. was a bit bizarre. Yeah. He really went for it. And you spent, I believe, 15, 20 minutes with him snacking on pastries before I arrived. Is that right, Richard? I might have done, Jamie, yes. So that is time that I had all to myself, uh, my own personal memories of Nicholas Parsons. Yeah, yeah, lovely. (laughs) But nothing you can repeat. No, certainly not. No, fair enough. Okay, so yes, as a, a tribute to Nicholas Parsons, this week, courtesy of Big Finish Productions, here is the first 15 minutes of Terror Hawks Audio Series 2, Episode 1, The Sale of the Galaxy. Terrahawks, stay on this channel. This is an emergency. show yes doctor one of the most popular in the known universe i'm well aware of the show's reputation lieutenant which is why i'll be turning down the invitation to appear why anyone would agree to play his sick game is a complete mystery the show's a bloodbath i think that's wise tiger judging by the reports that i've read starson's doesn't sound like somebody we want to get tangled up with without first conducting a thorough investigation normally i would agree But the invitation continues. Go on. It would appear that Starsons blackmails his contestants into appearing by kidnapping those closest to them. Evil. Utterly evil. I'm guessing that he didn't just write to us in order to outline his plans. No, Doctor. He writes to inform you that he has kidnapped somebody of the utmost importance to you. Should you wish to see them again, you must join him for a recording of his show. 
the utmost importance. Who could that be? Well, you're still here. Oh, and uh, you too, hero. What is the plan of action, Doctor? Hmm. Surely you're not hesitating, Tiger. Whoever this person is, they'll need our help. We must go. Yes, we must. I'm just wondering who our fellow contestants will be. What is it, my child? A written communication has arrived for you. Then where is Youngstar? Fetching the post is just about the only menial task I can trust him with. I have no idea, my grandmother. But look, it is from a famous celebrity, Nickel Plate Starsons. Oh. Uh, my uh, grandmother? Uh, Are you unwell? Uh, uh, no. Uh, no, my dear. It is just that I have not heard that name for a very, very long time. Tell me, what does it say? Hmm. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> hmm. My dearest Zelda, I hope this letter finds you unwell. Let us forget the past and skip to the chase. I want you to appear on my game show and simply won't take no for an answer. The cheeky swine! All these years without a word, and now he wants me to appear on television? I wouldn't lower myself. It may also interest you to know that I have your son. What? Should you wish to see him again, I suggest you join us for what is certain to be an exquisite evening's entertainment. Yours, Nickily Wickily. What means this? Ah, oh, never you mind. I can't believe it. He's taken my baby boy away from me. Well, Uncle Youngster has been missing for three weeks. Oh, really? I hadn't noticed. Anyway, that is beside the point. I could quite happily live with the idea of never setting eyes on my cretinous offspring ever again. Then what is the problem? It'll be a cold day on Mars before I let my ex-husband take custody. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Is this Starson Studios? Is this what? Starson Studios. Look, it's written here on my letter. Oh, right, yeah. So? Yeah? Is this the right studio? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, there you are, my dear, dear boy. I'm glad you could make it. What? Oh, no, it's you. I'm such a big fan, Mr. Starsons. Of course you are. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's very exciting. I can only imagine. Now, have you got any questions? Uh, well, only one. Why did you invite me? Well, now, why wouldn't I want to spend time with a handsome young chap like yourself? Well, people usually ask me to go away rather than come closer. <laughs> come, come, my boy. I have trouble believing that. I don't. Let's cut to the chase. I'd like to offer you a job, young star. A job? Yes. Now tell me, have you ever considered becoming a television producer? <laughs> you are? You're making him a producer? I've been working for you for three years without a promotion. No, 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 no. I hired you as a runner, didn't I? Yes, but... Now tell me, purely hypothetically, of course, how would a runner continue to well run after having both of his legs ripped out of their sockets? Uh, 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 I'll fetch the coffee then, sir. <laughs> good man, good man. Now, young star, let me show you the keys to the kingdom.
I still don't understand the title. Why is it called Sale of the Galaxy? It's a con. During the final round, contestants are asked to estimate the cash value of their own lives. And if they're successful? Well, that's the problem. I've watched more episodes of this sick show than I care to count, and not once have I seen anybody win the game. Then what's the point? Starsons is a sadist, pure and simple. He could just murder the people he blackmails into visiting his studio. But by playing his gruesome game, he gets to draw out proceedings and relish in the misery of others. I can understand how they feel. What was that? Oh, nothing, sir. Oh, I can't believe it. Me, a big-time television producer. It must be very exciting for you. Oh, yes, but I mean, I really don't believe it. Why do you want me to have the job? I can see there's no fool of you. You clever boy. You've caught me red-handed. I suppose I wanted to keep it in the family. <laughs> then why did you ask me? Well, you know the old saying, blood is thicker than water. No, I don't know that one. Oh. Look, I wanted to hand the reins of my operation over to somebody who was a chip of the old block. I don't forward. Oh, for God's sake, young star. I am your father. My father? Yes. But I don't have a father. Yes, you do. But your mother... Well, that's a long story. I have a... a daddy! Oh, daddy! Ah, oh, son. Yes, daddy! Don't touch me, please. This is supposedly the most evil television studio in the universe? Hmm, seems fairly basic to me. What? Oh, I assure you that appearances can be deceptive. Speaking of which, how does my hair look? Your hair? Hmm, repulsive. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's how he likes it. Now, where is he? Mine uncle? Who? No, no. Nickly Wickly, I mean, Starsons. Is that him over there? Where? Where? Over there. The one caving in an intern skull with a vending machine. Oh. Here we go again. Oh. Zelda? Zelda? Is that really you? Ah. Uh. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Come on, Zelda. Pull yourself together, girl. Oh. Darling, darling, darling. So glad you could come. It's been such a long time. Now, how are you, sweetie? Tell me everything. You're right. It has been a long time. And all along, I've been waiting to give you a piece of my mind. Now, you nickel place. Zelda, Zelda, darling. It's been lovely to see you. But, but we have but... a show to do. And without me, there is no show. Very important, you know. Mustache. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to catch up once the cameras are rolling. Ciao. Well, that was... Heavenly! Okay, everybody, remember where we parked. I had no idea Starson Studio was located on a space station. Very impressive. Okay, everybody, let's make this quick. We go in, grab our man. Or a woman. Uh, or woman, and leave. If I can help it, I have no intention of joining in with any of Starson's games. Here's the entrance. 
One of my stars is Kate Kistrel. Oh, hi. It's, uh, Crusher? Yeah, that's right. You signed my head. Yeah, I don't suppose this time you can sign my... We don't have time for this. What? Who are you? Tiger Neinstein. Dr. Tiger Neinstein. Tiger who? Ah, uh, you're one of our contestants. <laughs> well, it's been nice knowing you. Yeah? Contestant through the right hand door, guests through the left. We're sticking together, if you don't mind. Oh, but I do mind. We'll be all right, Tiger. You deal with Starsons, and we'll, um, see if we can locate our friend. 10 10, Mary. <laughs> Shall we? Yes, let's. The sooner we... What's that noise? Look up there. The airlock. (coughs) Oh, my. I hope for Tiger's sake that isn't how they treat all of their guests. You've had it now, mate. I said you wouldn't cut it. I'll cut you if you speak to my son like that again. Oh, uh, we was just joking. Oh, I do love a good joke. Here's one for you. What's the difference between a healthy, happy runner and one who's been torn into shreds by the razor-sharp teeth of an obscenely talented game show host? Uh, I don't know. A five-second head start. Understood? Now, son, that's what we call a running joke. I've made a terrible mistake. No, no, no. I'm sure it isn't as bad as all that. Well, you know how you said you'd take care of nine star and mummy? Yes. And how you asked me to look after the other two contestants? Yes. Spit it out, spit it out. I'm sure it's nothing we haven't dealt with before. Well, in that case, one of the contestants told me he needed a breather. Right. So I took him to get some fresh air. Right. At the studio airlock. What? Only he didn't look any better for it when I let him out. You had one job to do, you Neolithic nincompoop. We go live in two minutes. How is it even possible to be so, so, oh, I suppose it can't be helped. Just find me somebody to take his place. But who? Lord knows who we'll find at this hour. Try the audience. Seat, um, oh, I don't know, um, A393. You can count, can't you? Sort of. That's my boy. That's my boy. Get on with it. Okay, ladies and gents, we'll be live in 20 seconds. Are the contestants strapped down nice and tight? (laughs) Nice gagging, Crusher. Thank you, sir. Okay, live in five, four, three, two, one. And now, live from Space Station Norwich, it's the Quiz of the Week. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. And once again, welcome to the sale of the galaxy. Our top prize tonight is this beautiful, ride-on lawnmower. Without any further ado, let us now meet the four lucky people who will be fighting for their lives with us today. Contestant number one, what's your name and where are you from? Damn it, Starsons. Someone get me out of this thing. Just what we need. I can see you're full of pep and vigor. Something I'm sure will see you perform very, very, very well indeed. I'm serious, Starsons. Also, I demand to know the identity of the person you say you've kidnapped in order to... Thank you, Crusher. Oh, you're quite welcome, Mr. Starson, sir. And now, to our second contestant. <laughs> Watch where you're putting your hands, you big oaf! Oh, what a beauty, this one. What's your name, and where do you come from? As you will all no doubt be aware, I am Zelda, 
one time resident of Guck, proud homeowner on Mars. Honoured to have you, darling. Absolutely honoured. Now, what would you like to come out of this game with? Oh, I don't know. Your severed head? <laughs> oh, 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 wonderful, wonderful. I've almost missed you. Contestant number three, what's your name and where are you from? Oh, Space Pop. I beg your pardon? <clears throat> Space Pop. Excellent, excellent. And where are you from? Benedicti de la canna, vita de dorma. Si, 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 all right, all right. Now, uh, moving on, we did have a very special guest lined up in the form of billionaire tycoon Alan Salt. Unfortunately, he had to step out for a moment. He was fired from the airlock. <laughs> in his place, what's your name and where are you from? Uh, uh, um, uh, Ethel Stroke. Um... Seat uh, A393. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, my dear. Now, on with the show and our first round, The Wheel of Misfortune. I don't like the way this is heading. No, I can't stay and watch this. Quickly, while everybody is distracted, we'll sneak backstage. Are you always like this? Wine, wine, wine. What are you moaning about now? Well, Mummy didn't do very well on that last round. No, but she didn't lose either, and that's all that matters, really. But she'll be ever so cross if she doesn't win. She'll be ever so dead. What can I do? Nothing. If you want to keep on the right side of your father, I... Oh, I've just had one of those whatchamacallits. An idea. Would it help my mummy? Uh who? Oh, sure. Why not? Uh look, you see that circuit board over there? Yes. Well, that controls the scoreboard for the next round. If somebody was to uh, accidentally switch a few of those cables around, well, to lose is to win, and he who wins shall lose. I don't understand. It would be a real shame if that scoreboard was tampered with. Well, moustache, I'll just leave this area completely unattended. Hey, I thought you said you had an idea. Oh, I get it. Now, where do I begin? Oh, dear. I'm not sure which way round I should... Maybe if I... Oh, dear. Well, I'm very sad to say that at the end of that round, it's time to say goodbye to our good friend, His Holiness, the Space Pope. And as we lash one of his legs to the wheel and the other to this ten-ton weight, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you've enjoyed your time here too, sir. Wonderful. I didn't understand it, but it was wonderful. There we are, the master at work. Yes, absolutely. Now, if you want to hear more of that, then you can pick up Terrorhawks Series 2 on CD and download from the Jerry Anton store from Big Finish. I highly recommend them, obviously. But yes, it's really nice hearing it and just remembering what fun he was yes. and how he took it all in his stride, despite yes. the fact that he was dealing with bizarre characters. Yeah. You know, a very strange situation. And being and, directed by you. I was going to say, That's... and playing opposite one bloke doing all the male voices, <laughs> which is what you were doing on the day. Yeah, that's right. Actually, the greatest compliment I heard paid to him was on the radio the other day, I think on the day he died, just commenting that he was what you might consider an all-rounder. I mean, he really had such a varied career. Many of yeah. us know him as a quiz show host. Many of us would know him from Doctor Who, of course, and from early movies as well. You know, he really did have a go at everything and excelled at everything he did, which is quite extraordinary. Yeah, a very bright and driven chap. Was yeah, Nicholas. absolutely. Yeah. So now, do you have some Alan Patillo messages as well? I do. Richard, so while we're yeah. going on with these tributes, absolutely. So over on Facebook, uh, Caroline Smith posted: His Thunderbirds teleplays were always full of great characterization and sophistication. Trapped in the sky, brink of disaster, perils of Penelope, security hazard, Atlantic Inferno, another Anderson legend departs. Thank you for the happy memories, sir. Chris Gibbing says much the same R.I.P. He came up with the most original episodes of UFO, The Square Triangle, which had a great idea and surprising ending. 
And uh, finally, Alex K said, As a kid, as much as I loved and respected Jerry Anderson, I knew I could never grow up to be him. To become a solid TV writer, director like Alan Patillo seemed far more feasible, and I was very happy with that. Now he's gone. There are people currently working in pop culture who could learn a lot from Mr. Patillo, tell a great story, and tell it well. That's it. R.I.P. Alan. That's great, isn't it? Nice. Yeah. I think that's a, a perfectly well summed up yeah. nice tribute. Exactly, yeah. So yes, and a reminder again, if you want to um, make a donation in Alan's name, then please do so to Parkinson's UK. Yeah. If you've got any memories you would like to share with the family mm-hmm. of either Alan or Nicholas, then do email them in podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Just uh, mark it that it's you know relating to Nicholas or Alan, and we'll do our best to pass those messages on. Oh, great. That's nice. Yeah. Now. Yes. Should we go from the sad to the ridiculous? Oh, what? But don't we always? <laughs> Almost always. Yeah. Chris Dale, a name you should be very familiar with by now. Mm-hmm. For some reason, he keeps coming back every week. Yeah, because well, you keep asking him. Oh, yeah, that's why. And he reviews a random Jerry Anson episode in a segment which is very cleverly entitled The, the Randomizer. Randomizer. <laughs> so, should we just let him press his button and do his thing? I think we ought to. Okay, Chris, get your button out. Let's do it. No, no more grapes, please. Oh, hi, everyone. Um,. So, I have a cold today, and this is not, like, a sketch or anything. I really do have a cold. Um, Marina's taking very good care of me, though. Um, anyway, uh, so I really do not feel up to recording a randomizer today. The good, in inverted commas, news is... I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I record the, uh, the actual episode, you know, commentaries, uh, before the introductions in most cases so i already have an episode in hand and um yeah we'll play that um so here's one i recorded earlier which is sure to be near the top of everybody's uh, wish list for a randomizer appearance it's the protectors and it's implicado well um Yeah, Um, for what you're about to hear, or perhaps even not hear, I do apologise, The Protectors, Series 2. Now, I do, I do enjoy The Protectors, I do, I do think it's a pretty good show. I just have a huge memory block on so much of the second series, and in particularly, in particular the Euro episodes, the European episodes. Um, Oh, and we're opening with a fairly glamorous location. Um, Peter Firth and Patrick Moa are in a car. You know, I think we're in Spain. Um, I would guess Madrid. And um, out of the way, we are on a building site. And it's the sort of thing. You know, it's the kind of building site you could find. You know, somewhere in Hackney. It's a uh, exotic location filming. Spain, a building site in Spain. Anyway, there's a chap pulled up in a car, told another chap to get out and uh, go see Patrick Moa. And the, I should explain, the episode title came up and I have no memory of what this is about at all. Um, which doesn't bode well. I know, and I know I've seen it, but um, as I say, the Protector Series 2 Europe episodes are just this sort of black hole of memory for me. I know I've seen them all, but um, of all the Jerry Anderson episodes that I've seen... Protector Series 2 is by far the, the, the episode that um, has stayed in my memory the least. Anyway, Patrick Moore is uh, showing a briefcase presumably full of money to uh, the, um, I don't know, mob boss's henchman. He's swapped it for a package of something. Meanwhile, Peter Firth, who looks very young in this, is um, waiting at the car fiddling with a camera. It's all go, this opening, as you can uh, probably tell. Who is that boy? I don't know, Patron. He must be one of Raphael's runners. He had a camera. Shall I go back, Patron? No. Do it later. Once we both have our own natural voices back, I mean, neither of us is not dubbed, are we? Oh, dear. So now Patrick Murray is um, hiding the suspicious package somewhere on the building site. Peter Firth is still fiddling with his little camera. And he looks so young in this. I mean, um... I've seen him in things, you know, made around this time. Um, but, oh, yeah, for those people who are, 
you know, know more from things like uh, Spooks, which I believe is called MI5 in the States, possibly. Oh, he just looks like a, a teenager. So Patrick Mower has hidden the suspicious package in the toilet. I think he's taken a little bit for himself, though. Not good. Anyway, um... <sighs> this opening. This opening is... It's so... It's so like... We're trying to, to ape the traditional ITC stuff, but we, we're having to use a lot of stock footage for this. I mean, I know that um, the helicopter shot is taken from, from Russia with Love. I don't know what sh that um, the shot of the bridge exploding is from, but that's turned up in a few things. I believe the car flipping over was an accident that was, sh that was shot for this show. Um, oh, Tony Barwick wrote this one. Okay. Was this before or after he went insane? Because if it's before... So now our uh, criminal Patrick Mower and his Peter Firth little pal have um, gone to a cafe, but um, a couple of police cars are pulled up outside. This doesn't bode well. Oh, and I've seen them. And swapped the little pouch that he took out, put it into uh, Peter Firth's bag. Oh, and I think that one of the uh, policemen here is, um... Oh, oh, hang on. Yeah, I think that is um, Stephen Greif. Is that how you pronounce it, Stephen Greif? Um, the first Travis of Blake Seven. He wants to know who's baggage. Well, it's mine. He's found. I've seen that before. You're under arrest. A suspicious package in Peter Fett's backpack. I also noticed that the um. There's a man behind the bar there. I, I can't remember his name, but he was a regular extra in um, UFO and Space 1999. And of course, Patrick Mower is one of uh, only a handful of guest actors to do uh, to appear in all three of the uh, live-action uh, ITC Anderson series. He was in uh, UFO and Space 1999. Um, we've already covered, actually, one of his episodes with All That Glisters. And um, the, surprisingly, there weren't that many other actors who, who appeared in all three. I think... Um, Douglas Wilmer was one, and Mrs. Douglas. Drew Henley was another, and of course, uh, everybody's favourite, Shane Rimmer. It's my son, Stephen. But I imagine there were probably quite a few more extras who did all three as well. People like Alan Harris and Mike Stevens and so on. Yes. Contessa, my name is Dr. Dove. I think Dr. Dove? I to explain the situation. Oh. So the Contessa has been phoned by a lady in the... Neil Hallett will explain. My respiratory nerves were crushed by the impact. Is the condition permanent? That's too soon to say. She is not to be excited, so I can't allow you to stay too long. All right. No puppet shows, no balloon animals. Mrs. Douglas, I'm Caroline Di Codini. I'm here to do whatever I can. Mrs. Douglas seems to be stuck in a sort of... Go straight to the Madrid police and try and see the boy. Iron lung machine. Cafe where he was arrested. Right. Evidently, evidently she is uh, Peter Firth's mother, I guess. And she's filled in Caroline. Caroline has now uh, gone out to Madrid with Paul. Um, I guess this is a, a Robert Vaughan free episode in that case, then. Stephen, are you denying that the police found cash in your bag? No. But you are saying you know nothing about it, nor how it got there. Yeah. Someone must have planted it. <gasps> oh, a budgie! A budgie! Oh, hello, Budgie. Hello. Oh, no, don't take the... No, no, no. Oh. Bring back the Budgie. Oh, we were supposed to be looking at Tony Anholt asking people questions in the background. I want to see the Budgie again. There's a sweet little green Budgie that a woman just reached into a shot and... Uh, English. Pulled out. Aww. Have you ever seen this boy here before? Bye-bye, Budgie. Cerveza, por favor, frío. It is thirsty weather for asking questions. Ooh. Perhaps you ask the wrong people. That sounded uh, sounded like a code. Cerveza. But um, Tony, no, not Tony. This is Paul. Paul Boucher, as played by Tony Anhot, who also played Tony Vadeshi. I, I do struggle to keep them <laughs> separate in my mind when I'm doing these. The man you won is Rafael Santana. But if Robert Vaughan isn't in this one, then it's um. Today he'll be at Manzanares, El Real. 
It'll be nice to see uh, Tony get up. No, not Tony. Yes, Tony. Tony. Tony Blaine Paul get a bit more to do. I'm sorry. <sighs> I'm in over my head here. This is vaguely starting to come back to me. I mean, I know I must have seen this about, you know, two or three times over the years, but not, I don't know what it is, but nothing about the European-based episodes of The Protectors really, um, really s stays in my head. Which is a shame, because uh, some of them look um, really nice. So Paul just um, stopped off to get a, um, directions from a waiter who, once Paul drove away, gave a little suspicious look to the camera. Madrid just seems to be populated with uh, shifty waiters, according to this show. Paul is, um, now seems to be at a reservoir that uh, obviously isn't a place where he can uh, meet anybody, because uh, he can't get in there. So, oh, okay. Three-point turn away from the reservoir, but he actually backed into the fence there. <sighs> oh, Tony Anholt, I'm... You... You're such a good guy, and I'm criticising you for your driving. Not that I could do better, but, you know... If you hit the fence, it may be time for a retake. Anyway, after that um, interlude of Paul going to the wrong place, I guess, he now seems to be in the right place. He has found Patrick Moa's car. And Patrick Moa himself just sort of sat out in the desert, getting sloshed. And he's wearing a Fabulous hat. Uh, yeah. hmm. I'm looking for Rafael Santana. Why? I want to talk to him. He isn't here. Mm -hmm. All right, so Patrick Moore is, uh, has um, gone oh, into hiding. Him. Give him a message, will you? Pretending to be somebody... Who shall I say the message is from? Just a friend. A friend of Stephen Douglas. <gasps> I said that. I think perhaps it is better that you give him the message yourself. Here. So, Paul's been handed a bottle, and, um... Oh, now someone's taking shots at him. I don't think that's Patrick Moe doing that, but he... Oh! Paul's been hit in the shoulder! Ah, there's a guy in a white top. <gasps> Several guys in white tops! Got him surrounded. Oh, this is quite um, quite skillfully directed. I think there's lots of um, it's lots of long shots. Oh, and now we cut back to Tony Anholt, clearly in a studio, several months after all the location stuff was recorded, standing on a sand pit. And Patrick Moa got away. Ow! Does that hurt? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, nothing's broken. Mm, but you'll have a nasty bruise in the morning. Ooh, she kissed him. Could have been worse. I do like it when one of the regulars doesn't turn up for this show, actually, because it's kind of like... It gives a you know, slightly different dynamic when it's just the Contessa and Paul, or just Harry and Paul. Polite refusal to interfere. They say it is a police matter. In the meantime, I did get this. Who is he? I don't know, but he's been following me all day. Ah, it's a photo of the chauffeur of the, uh, the car that turned up at the building site. Yeah. I worked for him. Then I think you'd better start at the beginning. And this time, I want the truth. Wait, if she didn't tell him... If he didn't tell her about... The boy has told me the whole story, Harry. Oh! Robert Vaughan's turned up. He apparently loses his okay, it's only, what, halfway through the episode? He finally decided to get out of bed and join us today. The boy's very worried. Had a very hearty breakfast before he uh, showed up for this episode. Sympathetic ear. He then tells the boy he might just be able to help him. Perhaps even earn himself some extra money. Yeah, I thought, how, how did they find out about Patrick Moore if um, Peter Firth didn't tell them? The boy becomes a runner. You're right. And when he Again, this is one of the dangers of waffling over something that I'm not entirely uh, simply tells him, narcotic. 100% familiar with. I kind of waffle over important information and don't notice when I've done it. He's trapped. All he can do is go on working for Santana to earn enough money to buy his ticket home. You know, I think we ought to put a little pressure on Senor Santana. Okay by me. 
do I have to do anything? Because I'm not in the mood for doing anything this week. I mean, I, I'm only just now appearing in the episode. Anyway, they're now staking out the cafe, and uh, Patrick Murr is back. Sadly, the budgie is not. Have that one on me, Santana. Oh, and Paul failed again. <laughs> oh, God. He just got shoved out of the way and landed on his bad shoulder. So after a brief car chase, they've... Uh, well, Moe's pulled over just round the corner, really, and uh, Harry and the Contessa are giving chase on foot. And up some stairs. Now they've gone down some stairs. Well, we lost. Oh, well. We tried. It'd be difficult to find, but we still have this. Oh, yes, the uh, picture of the uh, chauffeur of the uh, the naughty bad man. <laughs> <gasps> Who has just found Patrick Moa. Oh, and he's put on his black fedora so you know he means business. Where's the boy? What boy? The boy with the camera. Oh, he... He's gone back to England. I, I just used him. Lies. Oh, the, uh... Please. Who are the people following? Boss's headquarters now, I guess. Giving Moa the full, uh, lamp-in-the-face treatment. Oh, it's too bad. He's given a nod to the, uh... The henchman with the fabulous moustache and the even more fabulous, um... Pink tie with flowers on. They seem to think that... He's brought out his gun. Is this the end of Patrick Moa? But he's got to annoy us all in, in all the glisters. What are you going to do? The henchman's even got a pink handkerchief. <gasps> Whoa! Action Moa! Straight out the window. Okay. Hmm. Well, that was the place you were at just before you were arrested. Well, Patrick Moa's um, pretty good at escaping from people in this. What kind of a guy was it? Big one. Expensive, you know, limousine. Mm -hmm. With someone in it who obviously didn't want to be photographed. But there was no film in the camera. Okay. I may be able to obtain your release, but I'll need your cooperation. So, where's Moe off to now in his uh, little red car? Back to the building site. Oh, of course, to pick up the, uh, the thing he put in the... Um, he hid the little package in the, uh, um, the tank of the toilet in, in a little... Uh, Empty house. And it's still there. Phew! I've been looking for you everywhere. This was my last hope. And I've been waiting here, Alice. I know what you have done. I don't understand all this. What's happened to you? I to kill you. How did you get away from the police? Well, they let me go. Let you go? Yeah. You know, a... a I think I'm starting to see why I didn't remember this because it is very sort of standard um, uh, drug smuggling plot. But um, where's the camera? Peter Firth and particularly Patrick Moe are uh, are really um, really saving this. I think because Patrick Moe is one of those actors where you see his name come up and I think, oh, and then a look at actually what he's doing and he's. I will make him tell you about the camera. He's really pretty good. There's a. He's got a bit of a sort of demented energy with this character. He's um, so desperate to get himself off the hook that he's quite willing to... Um, we'll meet you there. ...to basically set Peter Firth up for anything in order to get him to take the fall. And, you know, it's, it is kind of disappointing to me to see these Series 2 Protectors episodes come up on the randomizer just because I am so unfamiliar with them. But, you know... We've got to get through them. We've got to get through all of them. And uh, I think this is only like our fourth episode of The Protectors on the Randomizers. So, you know, f 52 total. We've got a long way to go with these. But I, 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 as I said, I do genuinely like this show. And I know when we, uh, when I conclude this, we're going to cut back to Jamie and Richard going, uh, I don't feel that way. But, um... I can understand why, for many Anderson fans, this sort of thing is a bit of a slog because it is just so um, at atypical. It's unlike his normal fare. Anyway, Patron, I brought the boy. He's here. Moa has dragged Firth off to a what looks like a deserted a warehouse or something. 
throwing him around a bit because. I was empty! I have the drugs! Oh. Patrick Moore is just freaking out while all, all Robert Vaughan is doing is walking slowly towards him, but of course Patrick Moore thinks that this is uh, somebody come to kill him. Because everybody's tried to kill him today. There is a misunderstanding. See my gun. See his bracelets and his uh, open shirt. Please! Here is your shipment. Take it. Please, if I run, I could have run. Oh. I've always worked well for you. Don't kill me. Please, please don't. So he thinks it's the uh, mob boss. But of course it's... Hmm. I think we were supposed to uh, to not guess that that was Robert Vaughan, even though they showed him, they showed his face, but then he took his hat off, and it's like, oh right, that's it. Mo is off to uh, Spanish prison, and Peter Firth, oh, he's also being manhandled by somebody. Oh, they even got the uh, head gangster and his henchman as well outside, off screen. Well, this is all, um... I'm not, I don't, the, I'm not, the word I'm looking for is not satisfying as such, but, um, you know, it ties up the loose oh, end. Man. And Peter Firth's back in England? Oh, no. Over here, darling. Ah, oh, she's out of her iron lung and into her blue dress. She's making excellent progress. May I thank you on her behalf? That's not because she's an ungrateful cow and she won't thank you at all. Oh. And anyway, that was Implicado. Uh, is that how I pronounce it, by the way? Is that Implicado or Implicado? I don't know. And that was, well, oh, I can kind of see why it hasn't stuck in my memory, but... Yeah, Policeman at Cafe, Stephen Greif, only had one scene. Um, for what it was, it was um, okay, you know. There are a few worse episodes of The Protectors. Not many, but there are many more, much better ones to come. Yeah, you're right, Chris. That's exactly what we do every time. <laughs> However, Chris, yeah. this week I just like to say, hope you're feeling better. Yes, poor Chris. You and your your coldy intro, your yeah. poor thing. Yeah, yeah, nasty. It does happen? See, it's respiratory stuff going around. It's terrible. Lost isn't it? about. It's true. Yeah, mm. but anyway, protectors. I mean, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Rubbish protectors. Mm. I mean, there are better stories out there, even in the world of protectors, and certainly outside of the protectors. Yes, sure. So I just, I, I just can't get into it. No, but it made for a very interesting primer. If you <laughs> condense it, it all down to about ten minutes, it's actually quite palatable. You're right. If you don't have to sit through all of it, yeah. then it's amazing. But actually, listeners, if you have got into the protectors. I would love to know which episode it was that turned you on to it. Right. Or, you know, if you'd watched some before and were like, oh, I'm not really sure. Yeah. And then you found one that you went, oh, OK, now I get it. What yeah. made you enjoy it? Yeah. Has some kind of special character moments in it or yeah. had some crazy cool plot. Let us know your favourite episode of The Protectors. And maybe we should try watching it, Rich, and see if we can get into it. Yeah, I suppose we ought to. Maybe. Does everyone know what we're talking about? Yeah, exactly, rather than just uh, yeah. listening to Chris's no, 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 <laughs> no, no. and yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, let us know, podcast at jerryanson.co.uk. Maybe your subject line should be uh, The Protectors or something like that. Yeah. And we'll read out maybe a little selection next week. If we get a few, absolutely. If we get more than one, yeah. otherwise we'll just read that like, one. Yeah. Done. Thanks, Chris. Chris will be back next week with another randomizer. Would you believe? I know they keep coming, don't they? <laughs> wow. Yes, that's weird. That the content of the randomizer is random, but the consistency is yes. Uh, yes. not. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Chris. Anyway, look, that is it. That's enough, isn't it? We've done all the stuff from the podcast. Oh, I should think so. Yes. We've had all that news. I've drunk out of my nuclear waste canister you have? and I'm not yet glowing green. Mmm. Nice. Oh, it's a bit cold now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't hold the temperature very well. So we'll be back next week. What should people do, Richard, in the meantime? In the meantime, you can uh, find us on Twitter. Just tag him, I'm Jamie Anderson, or me, Richard N. James, and hashtag it, Jerry Anderson Podcast, and we'll read out some tweets next time. Head on over to our Facebook group, and also, of course, don't forget to subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Leave us a rating and a review, and perhaps most importantly of all, share us with your friends so they get to hear us too. <laughs> you cannot resist that, no, can you? Your sorry. little rhymy thing. Yeah. No, it's very sweet. Oh, now before I forget, I've got another tiny bit of news. Oh, yes. It's only tiny. Oh, yeah. But the Joe 90 Blu rays, mm -hmm. all the individual volumes and the special deluxe edition are almost sold out. I think we're down to the last five. Right. 
So if you want to get them, they are now out of print. They will no longer be available. They're only done on a short run. So okay. go and grab them now. And I think Tim at the store has applied some rather meaty discounts. Oh, lovely. So, um, yeah, go along and grab those. That's it, though. We're done. Yep. Go and watch some stuff on the YouTube channel. Have a lovely week. Yeah. Look out for the picture of Joe 90's deceased adoptive mother on the Fab Fact on YouTube yep. later, this, later this week. And uh, we'll be back next week with some more Jerry Anson stuff. You betcha. Bye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. There. How is your car, Richard James? Uh, my car? Do you know, thank you for asking, Jamie. It's running very well now and certainly much quieter since they fixed the exhaust. Yeah, amazing what a spot of welding will do. Absolutely, yeah. And so what are you doing with the rest of your day? Well, I've got some secret documents arriving oh. from somewhere, which I am going to spend a couple of hours reviewing before right. signing off. That's Excellent. rather exciting. Very good. Uh, oh, hi, Dog's Minnie. just come in. Minnie's come in. I think that means she needs a wee, so Fair I'm going to let the dog out Hang for a wee. On. She's coming for a wee. Oh, I see. No, she's no, come into, the room. into my office oh, to say, "Can I please go out for a wee?" Oh, I see. And uh, yeah, some other bits and pieces like that. All right, Minnie. In a minute, she's, on, she's bursting. To... She's crossing her legs down there. Look, she, her legs aren't long enough to cross. <laughs> Minnie Jackson. Oh, say hello, Minnie. Come on, Minnie. Oh, she was squeaky until I picked her up. Oh, there you go. You can sort of hear her. Just <sighs> yeah. All right, sweetie. I'll right. So yeah, I'll go and let, I'll yeah. go and let the dog out for All a right, wee. Bye. Yeah. Put it down now. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun? Yeah.